I'm a clinical psychologist that works with children and families. And that's not a job you typically associate with technology. But I'm sure that you can't fail to have noticed that we are living in technological times. I mean, you're watching a TEDx talk that's going to be broadcast on YouTube. And it wasn't that long ago that that sentence wouldn't have made much sense to most people. And you don't have to venture very far into the world to notice that the pairing of children and technology is also an increasingly common thing. Children gain access to devices at younger and younger ages. To put this into context, since the 1970s, the average age of onset of regular screen use has gone from four years to just four months. Now, I've been a psychologist and a parent for quite a while. And when I first started working with children and young people, it just wasn't like this. It was unusual for children to have devices. It was unusual for adults to have devices. And children definitely didn't have mobile phones. But now that's all changed. All of my clients regularly have access to devices, both at home and at school. And children as young as primary school age now regularly have a mobile phone. So I think it's fair to say that childhood has really changed. Now, I know that every generation utters the immortal phrase, it wasn't like that in my day. But I do think we've got better grounds than most to stake this claim. Parents growing up today did so in a time when it wasn't compulsory to wear a seatbelt in the car. There were no microwaves. Your TV only had three or four channels. And wait for it, there was no internet. Now, while most of us think that we've adapted reasonably well to this brave new world, the ever-advancing technological landscape remains truly unfamiliar for many of us. But what about today's children? They're digital natives. They've grown up with this technology. For many of them, the first time that they met tech was in the delivery room on the day that they were born, when a photograph was taken of their birth and the announcement of their arrival pinged across the globe. So what does all this mean? I'm sure that you think seatbelts are a good thing. I definitely think microwaves are a good thing. And technology now is a helpful and integral part of everyday modern life. But experts are still unsure about the full impact of a digital childhood on today's generation, because they are living a different childhood to ours. They're less active. Latest government statistics show that nine out of 10 toddlers are living a sedentary lifestyle. 84% of preschool children are not having one hour's minimum activity per day. Screens have been associated with childhood obesity and markers for type 2 diabetes. And children today are even getting less sleep than we did, with screens being implicated in later bedtimes, poorer quality sleep, and shorter sleep times. Even in 2018, experts can't agree on how much screen time children should have. The American Pediatric Association recommends for children aged two to four, they should have one hour's screen time per day. And for older children, it's moderate use, undefined. But our latest data tells us that the average four-year-old is already watching a screen for up to four hours a day. In Taiwan, parents are legally required to monitor their children's electronic device use. And they can be fined up to £1,000 if their child, up to age 18, is found to be using devices for an extended period of time. Now, I guess you think I'm going to talk to you about children and technology, and I certainly could. It's something I feel very strongly about. I am a child psychologist, after all. But there is something I feel even more strongly about, because actually, being a child psychologist involves spending quite a lot of time with adults, well, parents to be precise. Now, I worked out quite early on in my career that there's a predictable correlation between children and parents, where you find one, tend to find the other. <laughs> and I also worked out that if I wanted to intervene in the kind of difficulties that children were described as presenting with, I actually needed to intervene with their parents. Now, I know that parenting is a tough job. If you ever read the job description, 365 days of the year, 24 hours on call, no holiday, you wouldn't rush to sign up. And the toughest part about being a parent is that you have to learn on the job. Children, it seems, don't come with instructions. 
So how do you learn about parenting? Well, you can observe those around you, see how other families solve similar problems. You could go to a self-help guide. You could even watch a TED Talk. But the main root of learning about parenting actually comes from how we were parented. That's our blueprint. That's the model that we work from. Did you grow up in a family that co-sleeps? Do parents and children eat together? Do you follow a faith? Depending on whether you did these things as a child will significantly influence whether you do these things with your own children. But where does that leave us in respect of tech? We didn't grow up using tech. We didn't even grow up with parents who were using tech. So we've got nothing to model or benchmark our parental technology behavior against. If we haven't got the manual for parenting, we definitely don't have the PDF for digital parenting. But does it matter that we're parenting whilst using technological devices? Well, I think so, and for two very specific reasons. One, our digital parenting behavior actually determines our children's digital behavior. And our digital parenting behavior actually determines all of their other behaviors as well. Now, I hope I've persuaded you that tech is taking up permanent residency in our children's lives, and we're not entirely sure whether that's a good thing. But what if one of the causes of our children's tech use was actually our tech use? Now, much of the territory of parenting involves do as I say, not do as I do. And that's just common sense, right? There are loads of things that we do in front of our children all of the time that we wouldn't want them doing, like driving a car or paying taxes. But what about tech use? We do that in front of them all of the time, right? And lately, I've begun to notice that it is all of the time. The latest government data shows that the average British adult checks a device every 12 minutes, and they are online for 24 hours in every week. As an example, I recently went to a primary school, and as I came in the main gate, there was a big sign up from the head teacher addressing the parents that said, when you collect your child, please greet them with a smile, not a mobile phone. Now, I know that parenting is a tough job. I've spent many an hour at a windy park or an overcrowded soft play center. And back in the day, I could have caught the gaze of a fellow parent across the heaving, squealing ball pit with its faint or rather pungent aroma of feet. You've been there. <laughs> and I could have shared a look that said, I know I'd rather be at home drinking tea too, but we're here doing the parenting thing, and that makes us weekend heroes. But now I would struggle to catch anybody's gaze in the park, in the soft play center, even on a bus. Eye gaze has been replaced with screen gaze. Now, as early as the 1970s, social learning theory taught us that people learn through observation. We copy, mimic, and model what we see going on around us. And for children, this is the main route of learning just about everything that they master when they're young, and they are really good at it. If you've ever seen a child learn how to use a device for the first time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, if you've ever heard a child use a bad word and then work out where they got that from, you also know exactly what I'm talking about. So children today are observing behavior that involves checking a device every 12 minutes. That's what they now see as normal. That's what they're going to model. It's stating the obvious to say that if we want them to do something different with their tech behavior, we're going to have to do something different with ours. But what about all the other behaviors that I alluded to? Our children are arguably the first generation growing up having to compete for parental attention with something as all-consuming and ever-pervasive as technology. Now, we know a lot about child development. We know that when adults speak to young children, they do something very instinctive. They modify the way that they communicate. They use a higher pitch. They simplify the grammar. They use an animated expression, and they really engage. Let me show you. Hello there. Thank you so much for coming today. You guys have seen this, right? Now, we call this Mother Ease. I'm sorry, dads. And we know that Mother Ease is the optimum communication style for children to learn language at a young age. Research shows that children at 11 and 14 months who are exposed to Mother Ease 
knew twice as many words aged two as children who weren't. So what does it mean to a child building their language skills with a parent who's got one or even two eyes on a screen? Well, firstly, we know that a parent who is distracted by technology is going to be significantly less likely to be successfully using Mother Ease. Secondly, we know that children require a reciprocal two-way interaction in order to help them learn social cues, read body language, develop their emotional literacy. We call this the conversational duet. But what's happening to a child's duet when one party is on the other line? Researchers at the University of Michigan have coined the phrase technoference to describe parents' behavior that involves excessive use of technology that was interfering with their parent-child interactions. Data from the Daily Family Life Study from North America between 2014 and 2016 showed that parents who had higher levels of device use during their parent-child interactions had children who showed significantly more externalizing behaviors. That's tantrums to you and me. But am I just overplaying it? I'm talking about the effects on children of their learning and their behavior, and whilst I'm sure all of us would agree these are really important things, they're not life or death matters, are they? It's not that serious, or is it? When the American tech giant, AT&T, began to roll out its mobile network coverage, it did it in one area or region at a time. We've now been able to look back at that data, and we can see that when each area or region first received mobile network coverage, the number of children presenting at the emergency department with accidents and injuries significantly increased. So what's the solution? Well, I want my talk to you today to be a call to arms. Well, hands, really. Because I think the solution is quite simple. Great news. You don't need a digital detox. You don't even need to attach the phone to the wall with that curly wire like we did back in the day. <laughs> it's simpler than that. I just want you to put your phone down. When you're talking to your child and hearing about their day, please, Put your phone down. When you're eating or sharing a meal as a family, please put your phone down. When you're driving with your children in your car, put your phone down. When you're walking in a busy London street and texting whilst you're on the tube, please put your phone down. That is basic health and safety. <laughs> but seriously, if you want to support your children's development and better manage their behavior, the solution is simple. Put your phone down. As parents, we are the single most source of importance for our children's learning, development, and emotional security. When we're with them, don't they deserve our undivided attention? So please, put your phone down. Thank you. Thank you.